So ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army. Our program tonight is with Mr. Frank O'Reilly and our moderator this evening is Dr. John Moss, who is an educator at the National Museum. And I'm now going to turn you over to the capable hands of Dr. Moss. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see you for our, our, our book, to, uh, our uh, lecture tonight, a presentation, a discussion with Frank O'Reilly. And I'm uh, especially pleased to be able to introduce Frank. Uh, Frank and I went to Washington and Lee together. We were in the same class with the same advisor in most of the same courses. I had the same part-time job at the Stonewall Jackson House. So uh, we've not only known each other since uh, 1983, but uh, have, have kept in touch. It's, it's really my pleasure to uh, uh, welcome not only a noted scholar uh, of the Civil War, but also an old friend. So welcome, Frank. We're glad to have you. I, it, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, I've been excited about doing this. Uh, John has uh, been, um, uh, in many ways, the, the person who's always helped me understand and look forward uh, to uh, really doing good history. Uh, he, he's had me under his wing since we've been undergrads. Uh, we have shared a lot of classes together, but you've always managed to mess up the curve for us. By <laughs> I don't better. know about <laughs> so, but uh, uh, yeah, it's great to be back with you. Thank you very much. So uh, Frank, let me just tell the folks uh, on the program tonight a little bit more about you in detail. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Frank O'Reilly is the author of the acclaimed book, The Fredericksburg Campaign, Winter War on the Rappahannock, which received a 2003 nomination for the Pulitzer Prize in Letters. It was released by LSU Press in December 2002, and it, and it has won the 2002 Capital District Albany New York Book Award, the 2003 James I. Robertson Jr. Book Award, the 2004 Daniel Laney Book Award, and the 2004 Richard Barksdale Harwell Award, Book Award. He received his BA and MA in American History with a concentration in Early American Military History and Civil War Studies. He joined the National Park Service at the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park after serving briefly at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. He is now the lead historian for the Fredericksburg area battlefields. And most folks who know Civil War, when you mention Fredericksburg, uh, Frank is the guy who you think of. So, uh, uh, and he has earned that. He's spent a lot of time on the field, writing, researching, and talking, leading tours, so we're, we're glad to have you. And today we're kind of going to put a lot of your expertise uh, uh, to, to uh, the test here uh, by talking about uh, one of the Union generals who really had a lot to do with Fredericksburg. Um, he's probably best known for that battle, uh, Ambrose Burnside. So um, if we could uh, have the first slide, we'll show his image here. He's probably one of the most recognizable generals, don't you think, Frank? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Ambrose Burnside, quite honestly, I was uh, uh, both excited and uh, a little bit frightened when, uh, John, you asked me to, to speak about him. Um, people have very strong opinions about Ambrose Burnside. Literally every day, people come out to the Fredericksburg battlefield and shake their head and tell us uh, unabashedly that uh, Ambrose E. Burnside is an imbecile. And... Uh, an imbecile with <laughs> really exotic and stylish facial hair. Uh, it's amazing what, uh, what people think of when they think of Ambrose Burnside. Uh, he comes off as literally being the worst American army commander ever uh, and gave birth to one of the worst absolute disasters that the army has ever seen. Uh, he's a general who commanded the most prestigious uh, Civil War Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, for only 77 days. Um, he lasted only one week longer than uh, the even more infamous and notorious John Pope of Second Manassas fame. Uh, 
he's credited with launching himself recklessly and impulsively uh, into a winter campaign, which is anathema to 19th century armies and uh, a good many 20th and 21st century armies too. Um, his defeat at Fredericksburg literally destroyed the morale of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, it just damaged the resolve of the Northern people uh, during the Civil War. And it literally left Abraham Lincoln despairing uh, that if there was a place worse than hell, I am in it. Uh, there's not too many generals who could have done that uh, all by themselves. But uh, at the same time, I'm excited to have a chance to, to chat with you tonight because um, the popular, if not the ingrained perceptions of, Abr uh, of Ambrose Burnside are not necessarily the accurate ones. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to looking a little bit more closely at, at who this fellow was and what he did on the battlefields. Great. Uh, Frank, we were talking earlier about biographies of Burnside and um, we quickly learned or reminded ourselves that the last major biography of Burnside came out in 1991. So it's, it goes back quite a ways. Uh, has there been much, I, I know there's been uh, research about Burnside in Fredericksburg or Burnside in Antietam, but has there been much research on him uh, as far as an overall biography? Is, uh, can we expect to see anything like that? Honestly, he is the forgotten man. Uh, there have only really been two biographies ever on him to, to really speak of, maybe three if you count uh, Augustus Woodbury back in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, but the only modern biography is done by William Marvel in 1991, uh, just simply called Burnside. Um, fabulously well-written and well-researched and well-argued. Uh, when it comes to, to looking at Burnside, he is scrutinized and analyzed um, by histories of the Army of the Potomac, uh, by Jeffrey Wirt and Stephen Sears when they've done their work. Uh, he's been analyzed by campaign studies like Earl Hess doing the, the Knoxville campaign in East Tennessee but um, nobody has ever felt the compunction about putting his entire life together in perspective, uh, certainly not in uh, more recent years. That speaks a, a lot to uh, the legacy that he left that people are willing to consider other people. Dan Sickles gets far more <laughs> biographies than, than Ambrose Burnside does, uh, but Maybe, uh, maybe if he had been a bigger character, uh, <laughs> more eccentric or something, that would have made him more appealing. Sure. Well, let's jump into his, uh, his military career. And uh, we'll start with the uh, first slide here. Um, is, uh, he, was, uh, he was at the Battle of First Manassas. And in fact, the more I started to think about uh, the battles he was in to try to pull together some maps and slides, uh, it really dawns on you that he was a part of a lot of the major actions and campaigns of the war. Uh, he, he wasn't someone who just came onto the scene and uh, had, a, had his brief moment uh, driving the Army of the Potomac to the defeat in Fredericksburg, but uh, he, was, he was there from the beginning. And um, what can you tell us about his, his uh, participation and service at at Bull Run, was it was it something that made him think that uh, he had a career, he had more opportunities? Did, did people look favorably on him at that point? Absolutely. In fact, I'm glad that uh, uh, we got a chance to talk about first first Bull Run. Um, when the war broke out in 1861, Burnside was uh, uh, literally the number one soldier in Rhode Island. Uh, Governor William Sprague thought very highly of him and asked him specifically to uh, uh, take command of the very first unit coming out of Rhode Island, the first Rhode Island uh, infantry. Um, during the first Manassas campaign, uh, he wound up uh, uh, leading the uh, turning movement around the Confederate positions along Bull Run Creek. And he was the very first one engaged on, 
uh, the Battle of Manassas or, or First Bull Run. Uh, he was eminently successful being the first one engaged and wound up uh, uh, driving the, the Southerners off of the, the northern end of the field or around Matthews Hill, uh, pretty close to the center of your map, right where the crossroads come together. You can see a big hill just north of the, the intersection with the Warrington Turnpike. Uh, he drove the Confederates off that position in utter disarray. Uh, his troops wound up regrouping after that and let others um, take the heavy lifting and do the tussling for Henry House Hill, which is where you see a lot of the red Confederate battle line uh, and where uh, they would have to deal with the likes of uh, up and coming Stonewall Jackson. Uh, Burnside really didn't go up against Jackson that day, but uh, when the fortunes of the day decidedly shifted against the Union Army, um, Burnside found himself uh, once again employed. Uh, he was among the rear guard uh, covering the retreat back to Washington. Um, Burnside's role at First Bull Run is really one of the few highlights in an otherwise very bleak uh, story for Northerners. Uh, his story was decidedly one of, um, of personal bravery, combat, um, and most importantly, uh, his story was the story about Northerners winning uh, during the battle. Uh, and it was others who uh, uh, couldn't hold up to that story or that storyline. Uh, he made, he became a Brigadier General as a result of uh, his participation at, at First Manassas. Well, uh, and if we can uh, bring up the next slide, please. Um, Frank, uh, it, it seems like Burnside's biggest success came pretty early in the war uh, at the, at the, on the coast of North Carolina and uh, particularly the Battle of New Bern. Can you, can you fill us in a little bit about his success there on the, on the uh, Atlantic coast in the early part of 1862 and, and the Battle of New Bern? Absolutely. I think this is one of the most defining moments in uh, uh, Ambrose Burnside's career. Uh, he was tasked after First Manassas with um, creating a um, amphibious minded uh, force of infantry that would work in cooperation with the Navy. Uh, it became the genesis of what we know as the Union Ninth Corps. Uh, Burnside had to work with some of the crustiest officers of the US Navy like uh, Admiral Goldsboro. Um, in a day and age when um, uh, the army had no jurisdiction and couldn't do anything but simply ask uh, for cooperation for the, with the Navy. And yet uh, Burnside had a, a, just a winning personality. Uh, he was congenial, he was outgoing, he was uh, gregarious, uh, he was disarming. Uh, not only did he get the Navy on his side, but uh, they became full uh, partners in trying to launch an expedition onto the uh, North Carolina coastal region. Um, it's really amazing what he was able to do to win over the, the naval elite to his side. Um, the other thing that's impressive about this is that uh, uh, working with a, a deep water Navy to create an invasion force that will land in North Carolina is a very complex operation and probably more complex than anybody else was doing at that time in the war. Uh, in fact, the only other Union general that uh, had a good cooperative agreement with uh, the Navy was Ulysses S. Grant at that time. Uh, so good point. Uh, Grant had to work with a, a brown water Navy and uh, <laughs> Burnside had to work with a deep water Navy and uh, not only wound up uh, being able to make a, an incursion onto the Carolina coast, but quickly uh, won a, a couple of very small but important battles, New, New Bern being one of them, uh, Roanoke Island being another one, uh, besieging Fort Macon uh, was also very important to this. Uh, shutting down the Confederates on the, on the Carolina coast pretty easily, um, handily, I should say, um, he was able to shut down about 85% of North Carolina's coastal region to blockade runners. Uh, most impressively out of the whole thing is that uh, uh, he won 
military victories at a time and day uh, where in the Eastern theater of the Civil War, no Union Army had experienced the rarefied air of, of victory on the battlefield. So uh, by August of 1862, he was promoted to Major General uh, because of these accomplishments at North Carolina. And uh, what he had created was uh, a lasting impression. Even after he left North Carolina, the federal forces never gave up the, the coastal regions ever. Mm -hmm. That was a significant, significant campaign. Sure. Yeah. So Frank, uh, about a month later, he finds himself back uh, away from the coast and uh, in September of 1862 at the Battle of Antietam. And um, one of the main, main features of the battlefield, everybody knows, is is Burnside Bridge. We have an image of it here uh, that we'll see. We can see uh, here a, a period drawing a sketch of Burnside's troops crossing the Burnside Bridge as it's known today. Uh, but <clears throat> there was some kind of, uh, and I, I, I'm asking this for, for my own purposes because I don't know uh, all the ins and outs of the organization, but there was a, an odd command structure here, wasn't there, Frank, where uh, Burnside really was with the Army of the Potomac, but not part of it. Can you fill, fill me in and, and our audience in on how that worked and what was the issue? You know, it's a, it, it's a great question, John, because uh, one of the people who was most confused and perplexed by the relationship was Ambrose Burnside. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, uh, he had joined forces with the Army of the Potomac um, at Washington uh, he had uh, participated in the second Manassas campaign uh, and now was joining with McCl George McClellan's forces uh, going into Maryland to deal with uh, Lee's incursion in Western Maryland. Um, he wound up in a unique circumstance where uh, two army corps were grouped together. Uh, the first corps under a brand new commander named Joseph Hooker and uh, his own Ninth Corps, uh, and he became a wing commander. Uh, it's not a particularly new or novel idea. Uh, Napoleon was marvelous at, at creating wing commands, especially for maneuvering, uh, where Burnside found himself getting confused is that often a wing command winds up uh, dissolving at the point of battle uh, where it's, it's a great maneuvering element uh, to keep these units together, but uh, in battle, the Corps should probably work a little bit more independently of each other and more to the function of the, the Army commander. Uh, so he found himself in a, in a pretty unique circumstance where um, physically his, his wing had dissolved uh, at Antietam, but uh, it had not been actually written out in orders saying that uh, he was no longer responsible. What really happened was that uh, the night before the, the great climactic battle of Antietam, uh, the Union First Corps and Joe Hooker literally marched off uh, to the opposite end of the battlefield and worked in a, in a very independent uh, vacuum. They didn't quite go under the wing command on the other end either, but uh, worked as a, an individual corps. Mm -hmm. Burnside himself found himself being a wing commander without a wing. Uh, the only part of it was his own Union Ninth Corps. Uh, what was crazy about it is that um, since Burnside had not been relieved of being a wing commander, uh, he still thought that he held that, that role um, and insisted that the Ninth Corps be commanded by its senior uh, subordinate general. So. Jacob Cox wound up being the nominal commander of the Ninth Corps, and Burnside, the wing commander, was perpetually looking right over his shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't really necessarily uh, change the outcome of anything going on around Burnside's bridge, but uh, it certainly added another link in the chain of command that sure. made it a little bit more ponderous. Got it. Uh, continuing on with Antietam, um, we'll see a, our next slide here. Uh, Burnside's uh, attack, the, well, the Ninth Corps' attack uh, on the, from the Union left across the bridge, uh, heading right toward the town of Sharpsburg, 
looked like this was going to be a Napoleonic type triumph of a flank attack hitting hitting Lee's uh, uh, right. But things didn't work out that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he Burnside literally took the uh, the Union Army to the brink of victory at Antietam. But literally, as uh, the sketch shows, they got within eyesight of, of the town of Sharpsburg and the one single road that Lee could use to retreat back across the Potomac. And then he got blindsided by uh, uh, Confederates who had uh, hustled up from Harper's Ferry that very day uh, and showed up in nick of time fashion uh, under General A.P. Hill. Uh, it was probably a pretty bitter blow for uh, Burnside, not only to be blindsided and uh, be stymied literally with an eyesight of his prize, but to be stymied by A.P. Hill, who had been one of his absolute closest friends uh, at West Point. Uh, wow. When it came to, to West Point, uh, Burnside's greatest friends, uh, closest associates were A.P. Hill and Harry Heath. Uh, so the at least one of those Virginians had done him in. Uh, at, uh, at Antietam. Mm -hmm. But I should add, uh, just as a little aside, that uh, as much as he got stopped at Antietam by uh, his former friend, uh, A.P. Hill, uh, probably the biggest assault on Ambrose Burnside came from another friend, uh, one that he didn't anticipate uh, hurting him, and that was George McClellan, the Union commander. McClellan uh, had um, been very close uh, with Burnside. It helped him out prior to the war when things weren't going so well for Burnside financially. Uh, helped him get a job with uh, the Illinois Central Railroad. But uh, everything soured in the summer of 1862 and particularly at uh, Antietam. Um, part of it is that uh, Burnside was doing so good that year and doing so well with complex, complicated inner service uh, campaigns that uh, Abraham Lincoln offered him the command of the Army of the Potomac, uh, not once, but twice that summer. Uh, now, Burnside gave full disclosure to, to McClellan and, and turned it down because he had profound loyalty to his friend. But uh, from McClellan's point of view, um, he viewed Burnside now as a rival mm -hmm. for his power and uh, did everything to make him uh, a non-entity. Uh, Burnside fought the prelude battle to Antietam at South Mountain, and almost all the troops that saw the heavy engagement there were his. Um, but uh, Burnside's name never even showed up in the official uh, report of that battle. Uh, it went straight with uh, naming the subordinate officers instead of him. Uh, when it came to Antietam, uh, McClellan changed his story several times and every time it got more venomous against uh, Burnside. And uh, the crux of it was that uh, Burnside didn't do a, a, a good reconnaissance, should have known that there were plenty of places to cross over Antietam Creek, didn't have to fight to, to own a bridge, uh, that he took way too long and that the battle had all come and gone before he ever got himself engaged and that uh, he waited too long and that allowed AP Hill to show up. Um, all of these things are um, now ingrained in the, the, the tapestry of national memory, mm -hmm. but uh, none of them seem to, to hold up to the scrutiny of the orders that were given at the time and the expectations that were delivered. So uh, poor Burnside was literally uh, uh, either cut out of the, the narrative altogether or uh, became the scapegoat for anything that did not succeed. Sure. Even though on a personal level, uh, he did take the bridge and he did wind up finding a, a, a Ford that could flank the Confederate positions. And he did come very close to winning that battle. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, a friend to the front stopped him cold and a friend to the rear stabbed him in the back. Wow. Well, he did get command, as we know, uh, November 1862. Uh, Burnside takes over once McClellan is relieved by President Lincoln. So that led to 
the move toward Fredericksburg and probably the the battle that he is most associated with. Uh, so can you tell us about McClellan, uh, 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 Burnside, assuming command, and how it happened that this attack at Fredericksburg, which you've literally written the book on, uh, <laughs> turned out so disastrously and en ended his command? Fredericksburg is, um, it's one of the trickiest campaigns that uh, uh, I've been astounded that there hasn't been more written on it before I, I showed up. Uh, now I'm really excited that uh, a lot of people are taking a hard, close look at this particular campaign. Um, just the idea of a winter campaign uh, in the 19th century is horrifying to contemplate. Um, most of your road networks are dirt. Uh, most of your logistics are wagon trains. Uh, and winter weather turns dirt roads into quagmires and armies are easily stranded without reinforcements or resupply. It's just a bad idea to even embark on this. Uh, a lot of people have found it very easy to dismiss and say that's because Burnside was an imbecile. Um, I don't see that. Um, what I see is that uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, needed a victory in the winter of 1862 and pulled out the stops to make sure that that happened. Uh, I see that uh, he took the single largest, most prestigious, powerful army with the highest profile and put it in the hands of the person he thought would most likely give it victory. And in the fall and winter of 1862, that one person was Ambrose Burnside, who had achieved so much uh, in the East where others had not. Um, the moving piece in this that, that uh, makes it... A, compelling uh, is that Lincoln is going to have every single field army in North America moving forward simultaneously this winter. Uh, Grant's going to make his first bid to capture Vicksburg. Uh, Sherman is going to be moving independently towards Vicksburg with the idea of cooperating or coordinating with, with Grant as he closed in. Uh, William Rosecrans was going to be moving through central Tennessee coming out of Nashville heading towards Murfreesboro. I have never seen all of the field armies moving forward simultaneously in this war until this moment. Uh, and that is all attributable to the commander in chief, uh, Abraham Lincoln insisting. And the reason he insists is that uh, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is about to be signed on January 1st, 1863. And that fundamentally changes everything in this war and in American society. Uh, it's probably the single most revolutionary thing to come out of the Civil War. Uh, but if it's going to be uh, legitimate, if it's going to be vibrant, if it's going to work, uh, it would rely exclusively on military victory. Uh, and that's what the president demands. When people like George McClellan or Don Carlos Buell dragged their feet, both those commanders were instantly replaced, uh, looking for more active participants. Burnside was um, uh, placed in command the day after the off-year elections in the North. And Republicans didn't do so well. They, uh, they wound up getting trounced quite a bit. Um, there's a hostile Congress that's going to sit in the new year that feels it almost has a mandate to change the way the war is being prosecuted at exactly the moment that Lincoln can't have anybody touch the Emancipation Proclamation. So he needs that victory even more. Uh, he sent an order directly down to the Army of the Potomac to relieve uh, McClellan of command and to put Burnside in charge. Uh, to add weight to the imperative here, he had a brigadier general carry it by hand to make sure that Burnside and McClellan both accept it. Uh, Carthinius Buckingham, great name, uh, literally had to go through a tremendous winter squall to, to get to the army. Um, and when he met with Burnside, Burnside for the third time was inclined to say no. Um, but uh, Buckingham on his own initiative came up with a neat ploy. He, uh, he bluffed uh, Burnside by saying that if he did not take command, then his arch rival and nemesis, Joseph Hooker, 
would be the next one to, to assume command. Um, that was enough for Burnside to realize that uh, he might not be qualified to command the largest army, uh, but he definitely knew that Hooker wasn't. Uh, so he, he accepted it. Um, now, when he did accept command, uh, there is no doubt what the purpose of his, his leadership is. Uh, the order that put him in command also has a paragraph saying, now that you command this army, what are you going to do with it? Uh, he had to have results. He had to have them yesterday. The incredible thing is he had the answer. Uh, he in, immediately proposed that the army should go to Fredericksburg. They had been operating in the fall of 1862 in the Piedmont of Virginia, around Culpeper, uh, Warrington, and uh, operating on a single track railroad known as the Orange and Alexandria. Uh, it was an impressive line. It carried up to 800 tons of supplies to the Army daily. Uh, unfortunately, the Army of the Potomac needed about twice that amount on a daily basis to function. Uh, it was long and stretched out, uh, and it was easily raided by uh, uh, either Confederate uh, uh, partisans or by possibly Stonewall Jackson pulling a second Manassas and showing up in the rear and tearing up uh, tracks and burning down supply bases. Um, Burnside thought Fredericksburg was the place that the army should be operating. Uh, it had a railroad that could handle a lot more tonnage. Uh, and more importantly, it had a railroad that went from Fredericksburg to Richmond, which was ultimately <laughs> their destination that winter. Uh, the other brilliant thing about a, a railroad is that even in winter, uh, it is an all-weather, all-purpose means of resupply. So it was a solid line of communications. Um, it was easily protected against raiders. Um, it had everything that Burnside wanted. And if you listen to Burnside, uh, he was thinking that about Fredericksburg even before he commanded the army. Uh, he sent a little note off to McClellan at one point saying, uh, if you mean to go to Richmond this winter, you have to go by way of Fredericksburg. And he said that uh, McClellan at least partially agreed with him. Uh, and in fact, um, that's almost certainly McClellan was thinking that was going to be the next step. Uh, he had already done a recon of, uh, of the town to see if it was even held by Confederates. Now that Burnside had taken command, uh, wheels may well have already been in motion to start the army in that direction. So it would move quick. Uh, and that was the, the key essential for, for Burnside. He was relying on speed and surprise to be able to seize the little town on the Rappahannock River and its railroad uh, and use it as a springboard on a quick drive down to Richmond, uh, forcing the Confederates to try to play catch up with him. And hopefully he could catch them strung out and maybe even defeat them in detail. Uh, a winter campaign needed to be short and decisive because the weather is so unpredictable. This seemed to have all the elements. Um, the only crux in it was the Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg and several of the other uh, east-west rivers across Virginia below them, like the North Anna River. Uh, Burnside had an answer for it. Uh, he requested pontoon bridge material with engineers to be ready to meet him at Fredericksburg so that he could cross the, these rivers without missing a beat. So speed was essential. It didn't meet with the immediate approval with the president. Um, several of the big heavy hitters out of the War Department showed up at uh, Burnside's headquarters. Uh, Henry Halleck, the general in chief of the army, uh, Montgomery Miggs, the quartermaster general of the army, and Herman Haupt, the chief of US military railroads. Um, it's not often that you see Halleck wander out of Washington. Uh, so for him to show up in a headquarters is a, a good sign that maybe this isn't what the president wanted. Uh, but Halleck didn't do his homework. Uh, he didn't have a better solution than, than Burnside. And in fact, wound up bringing uh, the swing vote with him. Herman Haupt to the railroad said Burnside was right and his railroad was better at Fredericksburg. Uh, so Burnside won his point. Uh, the president was won over, convinced that he had a general who really believed in his plans and believed in action and wanted to encourage that. Uh, he sent a note off to uh, Burnside giving his approval. 
with the caveat that uh, he needed to move quickly, otherwise not, uh, because it wouldn't, wouldn't work unless there was speed. Uh, he clearly underestimated Burnside. Uh, once Burnside was given the green light, his army was in motion within 24 hours. Uh, he wound up marching two days down to Fredericksburg in an absolute downpour of rain, and yet it was one of the most efficient marches the Army of the Potomac had ever had. Uh, no stragglers, nothing lost. Uh, they showed up at Fredericksburg and caught the Confederates completely off guard. Uh, Robert E. Lee had no clue. Uh, when 135,000 Union soldiers show up opposite Fredericksburg, there weren't a thousand Confederates anywhere near Fredericksburg. There was nothing to stop Burnside's progress uh, except the Rappahannock River. Uh, one of the great snafus of the Civil War. Burnside showed up, but his bridges didn't. Uh, bureaucracy in Washington had literally uh, buried the paperwork, uh, lost the, the, the chain of thought, and uh, the engineers were the last ones told about the plan. Uh, once they found out and went to General Halleck, Halleck's answer was uh, he wasn't going to slow down Burnside so they could catch up. It was up to them to quickly speed up their operations and get there. It took the engineers literally 10 days to create a wagon train that could carry them overland uh, to join the army. Uh, in those 10 days, the entire picture changed. Robert E. Lee had now a week and a half to not only figure out what Burnside had done, but to uh, block him. So when Burnside showed up, there weren't any Confederates at Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. But when uh, the pontoon bridges showed up, there's 78,000 Confederates on the opposite shore. Uh, at that point, Burnside had to admit this wasn't the, the project that he was proposing. Uh, and he tried to let the president know in a accommodating but very obtuse way that the campaign was over. Uh, he said he couldn't promise success as he once did when he thought all the parts of the program would be fulfilled. Uh, the president had an equally obtuse answer uh, saying, you have pontoons now, what are you going to do with them? So that was a nice way of telling Burnside the campaign wasn't over and that he needed to keep going. He looked at every viable crossing point on the Rappahannock above and below the town. And uh, at one point hatched an idea of crossing below Fredericksburg at a kink in the Rappahannock called Skinker's Neck. But literally as he started marching on that site, uh, uh, two things happened. Uh, one was that it started to snow and dropped about five inches of ice on his army. And uh, Stonewall Jackson showed up and wound up encamping right at the spot where he was going to cross. Uh, everything was thwarted yet again. Um, at one point, uh, Ambrose Burnside wrote to the president saying that he proposed that if they were going to cross, they would cross at Fredericksburg itself. Uh, with the logic that uh, it would cause the Confederates as much surprise as if they had crossed anywhere else. Uh, that's not a really strong endorsement of putting the army at risk. Uh, and the truth is, as much surprise as anywhere else, the Confederates weren't surprised anywhere else. So they weren't surprised at Fredericksburg either. Uh, that kind of harkens back to all the overtures of Burnside being an imbecile. But uh, I see it quite differently. I see a man who was trying to uh, tell the president that this is our last option, and it's not a good one. So it's time to, to fold our tents and, and call quits on this campaign. Uh, but he didn't want to do that directly. He wanted his commander in chief to do that. Uh, in turn, Abraham Lincoln approved the plan. So this was something that was going to go forward. I think there's a far stronger political imperative for Fredericksburg than a military necessity for it. Um, so, now locked into having to, to go across the river and have to make something happen. Um, and so I'd still thought about this as best he could. Um, it's easy with, for us to look backwards in history and forget the, the, the power of these people were here to win. Uh, they weren't here as a foregone conclusion that they had to lose. Uh, Burnside, again, 
came up with a plan where he recognized that the Confederates were strung out for above Fredericksburg guarding the river, below Fredericksburg guarding the river. They were guarding about 32 miles of riverfront. So if he made a quick lunge across the river at Fredericksburg, theoretically he could make a, a serious dent in the Confederate defenses before they ever had a chance to concentrate their forces. So again, speed and surprise became his greatest assets and tools. Uh, he hoped to lay down pontoon bridges opposite the city of Fredericksburg and then uh, quickly marshal his forces out beyond the town and onto the high ground on the opposite end of the Rappahannock Valley, an area that uh, later became uh, famous or infamous as Marie's Heights. Uh, of course, that plan didn't work. Uh, and the speed and surprise both collapsed right at the, at the brink of the Rappahannock River. And um, December 11th, 1862 was the day that Burnside was supposed to master the entire river valley. And it wound up becoming a, a day of absolute disappointment and unprecedented warfare. Uh, Confederate sharpshooters had been posted along the riverfront among the houses, uh, parceled out in small cells of two to 20 um, and making themselves very elusive and hidden targets. Uh, they opened fire on the engineers trying to br build bridges opposite the city. Uh, that was not really conventional warfare for the, the mid 19th century American armies. Uh, to have people fighting as individuals rather than as, uh, as units or forces uh, confounded Burnside a bit, certainly confounded his engineers who were unable to build a bridge because they were under fire. The Union Army opened up with uh, artillery on the city and the bombardment of the city of Fredericksburg was massive. Uh, in fact, uh, it was probably the largest mass of uh, uh, cannon put together up to that point in the Civil War. 178 cannon up to later, I think 183 cannon uh, opened fire on the riverfront and over 3,000 rounds were sent into the city of Fredericksburg itself and did a tremendous amount of damage. Um, but the Confederates proceeded to cling to the rubble and uh, thwart every effort to get across the river. That led to yet another thought, and that was to put Union infantry in pontoon boats and ferry them across the river and drive the Confederates away, establishing a beachhead would ensure that they could finish their bridges. Um, it's fairly intuitive in the 21st century to think that way, but on December 11th, 1862, there wasn't a single person in the United States Army that had ever done that. Uh, they had never trained for it. They had never read about it. Um, so step one in the campaign to Richmond was literally, let's make stuff up which is pretty scary <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, incredibly, uh, Burnside wavered on this and showed a, a weakness in command that uh, hadn't been seen before. Uh, he latched onto it and said, yes, let's do that. And then quickly rethought it and said, no, anybody who got in a pontoon boat would be a big target and easily slaughtered before they ever got across the river. But when nobody else had a better solution, he waffled back into, okay, if there were volunteers, he would consider it. Uh, he didn't have the moral conviction to, to actually order people to do this, but there were subordinates that didn't have that compunction. Uh, one of his officers immediately went to the nearest brigade at hand, explained the circumstances and congratulated them for volunteering. Burnside even wound up having to talk to a Michigan regiment to uh, try to talk them out of doing this uh, their brigade commander, a fellow named Norman Hall, literally kept interrupting Burnside, reassuring him that he could do it, we could do it. Uh, at one point in exasperation, he even turned to the 7th Michigan and he says, can't we do it, boys? And they give an obligatory yay, uh, and Burnside had to back down. Uh, and in fact, they did put them in boats, and they did come under fire, but they did make it across the river and drive the Confederates out. It's the first riverine assault under fire in American history. Um, arguably the first beachhead established under fire in our history as well. But even then, the unprecedented nature of the warfare wasn't over. Mm -hmm. 
Confederate sharpshooters under General William Barksdale um, may have lost the riverfront, but they clung to the city and continued to fight literally uh, house by house, block by block through the downtown area. Uh, in another unprecedented moment now of urban combat in North America. It was um, a pretty rattling experience for everybody. And it led to yet another uh, unfortunate moment and that was uh, federal troops looted the city. Uh, they wanted vengeance on somebody for having created this moment. Uh, Burnside was uh, left with uh, the worst part of it and that is that uh, his plan was about speed and surprise. And he had lost an entire day and the entire Confederate army was waiting for him outside the city of Fredericksburg. At that point, his plan was dust again. Burnside spent uh, December 12th bringing his forces across the Rappahannock River and also reconnoitering uh, the Confederate positions with the idea that he still had to win and he was still gonna look for the best opportunity available. Granted, every one of his plans had failed, uh, had limited now the number of choices left to him. But he did have one great asset, and that was he had profound strength. The Union Army was never as big as it was under Burnside. Uh, so he could use that to his advantage. Uh, looking at the Confederates uh, across a, a wide open floodplain, they were ensconced in a series of hills outside the town. Uh, he recognized real quickly that uh, the Confederates were uh, literally stacked from north to south or from their left flank north of the town to their right flank, uh, dangling almost five miles south of the town of, of Fredericksburg. Being oriented north to south uh, meant that uh, there were opportunities for, for Burnside after all. Another opportunity was that the Confederate line wasn't straight. It was bowed in the middle, it was concave. Uh, recognizing that he couldn't attack the center because being caught in a, uh, the middle of a bow, he would have been easily sliced up in a crossfire. Uh, so he avoided what we would call a re-entrant angle today. Uh, instead, he focused on the either ends that poked out towards him, uh, the bulges or the salients. Uh, the one on the, the north end was uh, Marie's Heights, and it had a stone wall. Uh, the one on the south was called Prospect Hill, and it had a stone wall too, uh, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, but Stonewall Jackson was south of Fredericksburg. An attack against the north end of the battlefield uh, might drive the Confederates off their position, but the Confederates could always fall back to another fighting position between Fredericksburg and Richmond. An attack against the south end, however, would not only make the entire Confederate line untenable, but it would also interdict a, a Union force between Richmond and Richmond's defenders. So there was a lot of merit to be said about attacking the south end of the battlefield. Uh, he marshaled the vast majority of his troops south of the town, uh, about 60 to 65,000 troops uh, that he put under the command of a very capable officer who uh, graduated very high at West Point, and that was William B. Franklin. Franklin was a, a fellow who was very good about details, but also could get caught up in details. And uh, talking with Burnside, uh, Burnside recognized that there were a couple of details that uh, bothered Franklin about making an attack. One was that he had a river across his rear. Uh, so if anything went wrong, he didn't have a line of retreat that he could count on. Uh, two, he had Stonewall Jackson in front of him. And that was a notorious career killer for a lot of Union officers. So. He had every right to be concerned about that. Um, and then in between, he had a, almost a mile of open floodplain without any cover. Uh, the Confederates would see him coming and be able to, to be prepared, if not to stop him cold. Uh, Burnside thought about that and uh, uh, agreed with uh, ways to mitigate that. Uh, one was to allow an entire third of the Union Army uh, to guard the crossing points below Fredericksburg as a safety net. So if anything went wrong with Franklin, he could fall back into their security. Uh, two, uh, they would make their attack before dawn and use the cover of darkness to get across the floodplain 
largely undetected uh, and then be able to strike the Confederates from a short distance rather than a long haul. Uh, that was the idea. That wasn't the execution though. And the execution falls apart for a couple of reasons. Um, Burnside does make a couple of big mistakes. Uh, one is that uh, he is going to rely on the oldest general in the army, a fellow named Edwin Vo Sumner, to be his confidant because he has more institutional knowledge than anybody else. Uh, he went back to Fredericksburg the night of the 12th to talk to his confidant and couldn't find him in Fredericksburg. By the time he was able to catch up with him, dawn was coming. Uh, he scratched out some hasty orders to Franklin that were uh, uh, dashed down to him, but they didn't get there until 7.30 in the morning. So forget about the pre-dawn attack. That wasn't going to happen now. Uh, the other thing that was seemingly mysterious is that the promised two army corps to guard the, the bridges didn't materialize either. Two small divisions showed up instead. And that's because Burnside had talked to his chief of artillery, Henry Hunt, who assured him that he had so much massed firepower at the bridge that the infantry was really unnecessary. Uh, if anything, it would have gotten in his way. So he felt that he had secured that, that safety net even without the necessary troops uh, or the unnecessary troops. The other big problem that uh, Burnside does is that uh, he doesn't explain those things. Uh, they just happen and then he dishes out an order to Franklin that was carried by uh, one of his staff officers, uh, a fellow named James Hardy. Uh, the order was kind of mystifying and misleading. Uh, 65,000 men were under Franklin's command. He had up towards 12 divisions of Union infantry and primed and ready for battle. And the order said to send a division at least to seize the heights by Captain Hamilton's or Hamilton's crossing the southern end by Prospect Hill. Um, keep its line of retreat well open, uh, keep it well supported, and keep the rest of your force ready for a rapid movement down the old Richmond Road. Um, on everybody's map except Burnside's, the old Richmond Road runs parallel to the Confederate line. If, on Burnside's map, it literally takes a right-hand turn and goes straight out to the Confederate flank. So on Burnside's orders, as Burnside saw it, he was saying, start an attack against the, the heights and take the rest of your force to that spot. Uh, to Franklin, he saw them going in opposite directions. Uh, the other thing that confounded him was having something planted in his mind of send a division at least is a small number. So he thought he had been relegated down to being more of a demonstration rather than the principal attack. And he followed it to the letter of the law. Um, that's regrettable and unfortunate for, for Burnside. Um, but at the same time, Burnside should have been aware of this. Um, what uh, uh, Franklin was a very strong associate of George McClellan's. Uh, George McClellan had been ousted by the, uh, from the army at this point. McClellan's second in command and closest associate Fitz John Porter was arrested uh, and was now going to be on trial for his uh, actions during Second Manassas. Uh, and Franklin was the next associate. So he felt he had a big target on his back and couldn't afford to interpret orders. He could only fulfill orders. Uh, and his safety would be in the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the order. Um, Burnside should have been more fulsome in what he was sharing. Uh, the other thing that is a big problem is uh, one that Burnside never anticipated, and that was the messenger. Uh, James Hardy is the fellow who took the order out of Burnside's hand. He knew what it meant. Uh, he knew the implications, and when he handed it to Franklin, and Franklin had nothing but questions, Hardy did not step up to answer he relegated himself to being a messenger boy rather than to be a factotum of his commander. So Franklin was left to flail in the dark. Uh, the order itself told uh, Franklin what he should do, but it didn't tell him what he was supposed to 
accomplish. I didn't have what we would call today commander's intent, uh, giving you an idea of what the objective or the goal is. Uh, it just had the mechanics of what you were supposed to do. Uh, so he really had no context in whether he was the main assault or the, the limited assault. Uh, from Burnside's standpoint, his, he commented afterwards, Franklin and I talked about it. He knew that what my, my purpose was. He knew my intentions. He knew he was the main attack and he just didn't do it. Uh, they would never see eye to eye again after that day. Uh, the limited attack was a small one. Uh, instead of 65,000 men, it was 4,000 uh, with another 4,000 in support. Uh, spearheaded by a pretty obscure general from Pennsylvania at that time known as George Gordon Meade. Uh, Meade did the, the impossible. He managed to get to the Confederate lines that day and he managed to break in. Uh, he ruptured the Confederate front line. Burnside was winning. Uh, it's hard to imagine that, uh, but he was winning. Uh, if his order had been fulfilled, if they had used a large force, Almost certainly they would have uh, uh, been defeated at the outset because they would have taken instant and overwhelming casualties that would have robbed them of their momentum. But a tiny group managed to slip in there and managed to make tremendous mayhem among the Confederates. The brilliant part was that now was a chance for um, all these unused Union forces to move forward in support and exploit this breakthrough. But Franklin never released them. Uh, Meade was eventually driven out and the losses were pretty heavy. Um, of the 8,000 Union attackers, 5,000 of them wound up as casualties. Uh, the Confederates had to pay for it though, um, expelling the Union Army. Stonewall Jackson lost about 4,000 men. 5,000 to 4,000 is pretty close to one to one. And I think it's a pretty good testimony at how that battle could have gone either way. Uh, the difference was that uh, uh, the Confederates sent reinforcements to block the breakthrough and Franklin did not. Uh, so in the end, the, the greatest effort that Burnside had hoped for victory had collapsed and failed. Um, it was a disaster, um, but almost nobody in the world talks about the Battle of Prospect Hill because mm -hmm. everybody knows Fredericksburg is the story of Marie's Heights and its stone wall and the wave after wave of Union attackers that bludgeoned themselves needlessly, uselessly, uh, criminally against uh, a Confederate position that simply could not be carried. Um, so we do have a question, Frank, about this, uh, uh, where you are kind of talking about Burnside, is that with, with these blunders and um, uh, questionable orders to advance. And, and even though he recognized that this was not the original plan, uh, one of the questions we have is, why did Lincoln stick with him and not cashier him like, he, like others had been let go? You mentioned uh, Don Carlos Buell and Fitz John Porter and John Pope kind of sent either home or, or and McClellan, but, he, but Burnside stayed in the army and uh, another one of our, our audience members says, reminds us that Grant could easily have gotten rid of him after the wilderness because of his slow timing. Why do you think, why do you think Burnside stayed with the army? I think uh, Burnside, uh, these are great questions. Um, <laughs> I'm really glad to hear them from, you, from your uh, uh, folks. Um, Burnside was a fellow who was still very aggressive. Uh, he was very offensive minded. Uh, he wasn't afraid of, of combat, and he was able to do amazing, sophisticated things. Um, we've been talking about an absolute disaster at Fredericksburg, but one of the most important parts was how did the Union Army escape that? They had a river across their rear and a, a victorious Confederate army immediately in their, their, their face, uh, and yet Burnside was able to extract his army masterfully. Uh, he got everybody out, literally under Robert E. Lee's nose. Uh, the only thing he lost was uh, a Pennsylvania band <laughs> who had slept in and missed the, missed the retreat. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really a logistical genius. Uh, later on, he's going to be moving into uh, uh, East Tennessee. 
Uh, and uh, he'll be the first Union commander to get into East Tennessee and create a, a permanent seat of federal occupation. Lincoln has been trying to get commanders to go to East Tennessee right from the outset of the war. Uh, and people like uh, uh, John Fremont said, no way. Uh, others who had looked at it, uh, like Buell said, it's impossible. But Burnside found out how to do it logistically so he could get a force there and keep a force there. And I think there's a sophistication to him that uh, is magnificent in movement, uh, in logistics, uh, and in taking care of his men. Uh, and let's not forget, uh, when he fights, in North Carolina, he wins. Uh, at, in Maryland, he wins. Uh, in um, East Tennessee, he wins. This is a man who knows how to, to win battles. And it, it's not just against um, second rate or third rate commanders. Uh, he's going to best James Longstreet in the Battle of Knoxville. This man's got ability. Well, uh, one interesting, uh, along those lines, one of our uh, audience members asks, uh, what leadership quality of Burnside do you think he was lacking, which caused the defeats that he did have? That's a great question. Um, Burnside has so many things going for him, but he does have um, a humility that often can be so self-effacing. It can even be a bit... Um, uh, troubling to the point where uh, he can talk himself out of his own confidence, um, like asking people to get into pontoon boats and uh, make a, a, a river landing. The, the other problem with being humble and self-effacing is that if you say it long enough, uh, people start to believe you. And then uh, uh, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy George Gordon Mead said that uh, at one point, saying that the problem with, uh, with Ambrose Burnside is that uh, he said it so often, even he believed it. Um, so uh, it doesn't inspire the greatest confidence in those around him. Uh, the other big problem that I see as, as a commander is that Burnside is a fellow who genuinely believes in what he's doing, and he believes in the moral rightness of it. Uh, and expects everybody else to share that exact same conviction with him. Uh, they don't all come from the same motivation. And uh, sometimes motivation means enforcement uh, instead of just appealing to everybody in their better nature, uh, let's do the right thing. Sometimes you have to make people do the right thing. Um, I don't like sports analogies very much. Uh, and I know you're already cringing at me, John, but uh, um, if, if this really was a sport, uh, Burnside would have been the captain of the team. He's popular. Everybody likes him. Everybody enjoys being around him. Uh, he's fun. But um, a team doesn't need a captain to succeed. A team needs a coach. And a coach isn't there to be loved. A coach is there to be respected and obeyed. And uh, Burnside didn't have that ability to mount him. Um, he could appeal to everybody's better nature, but he never was very good at enforcing it. Let's, let's, let's finish up with one last question that we have. At Appomattox, Grant was there, Sheridan was there. Where was Burnside? Burnside was sitting in Washington, despairing of ever getting a command again. Uh, during the siege of Petersburg in the summer of 1864, he is going to lend his name to one more gargantuan blunder, and that was the Battle of the Crater. Uh, again, a, a complex operation in which he uh, showed tremendous innovation. Um, he empowered his subordinates to come up with creative ways to break through the Confederate lines. He was inventive in creating tools for them when he didn't get support from high up. Uh, literally took a pipe dream of blowing up the Confederate lines and rupturing the siege lines uh, to the point of fruition. Uh, it was in the 11th hour, however, that uh, politics in intervened and uh, uh, destroyed his opportunity. One of the things that Burnside had done was train an entire division of African-American troops, uh, U.S. color troops, USCTs, 
um, to create a very sophisticated assault that would take this exploding uh, crater and then move up and down the Confederate lines to expand the breakthrough with their force. Um, in the 11th hour, uh, it was deemed that uh, the lead division should not be the, the USCTs. Uh, this turned into a disaster uh, that could also be have huge political ramifications. And 1864 was a presidential election year. So politics are everything. Um, the first division had to be one of the other divisions of the Ninth Corps. Now Burnside did himself no favors. He had uh, three divisions. One of them had an outstanding commander in front of them, uh, who is his go-to person, John Park. Uh, the other two were not even close to Park. Uh, it's pretty obvious who you give the task to uh, in the 11th hour, but Burnside was too egalitarian about it uh, and said that it wasn't fair. Uh, so he had them draw straws. Uh, it's a nice humane gesture, but it is not a good leadership gesture at all. And uh, as a result, he wound up uh, uh, with the likes of James Ledley and Edward Ferrero, who are probably the two most infamous, awful officers in the Army of the Potomac, much less the Ninth Corps. Uh, and the result was absolute disaster um, and slaughter. Uh, there was a official Army Court of Inquiry that blamed Burnside. The Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War strangely exonerated Burnside and blamed uh, George Gordon Meade instead. Um, it's really interesting because the committee uh, hated Burnside. Uh, they excoriated him after Fredericksburg, uh, didn't like that he refused to play politics with them. And uh, But when he came to the crater, it turns out they hated George Meade more than they hated Ambrose Burnside. So they exonerated him. Yeah. The army didn't care, neither did Grant. And uh, when he was removed from command, he was not permitted to come back. So the war ended without Ambrose Burnside. Mm. Um, I will say real quickly that um, uh, it didn't really hurt him in the long run. Uh, he was Rhode Island's favorite son and uh, wound up becoming governor for three terms uh, for them and then wound up becoming a uh, senator for them for two terms uh, before he passed away in office in 1881. Mm. So uh, um, Rhode Island sure appreciated him if nobody else did. But then again, Rhode Island's a pretty small place. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Frank O'Reilly, historian, uh, interpreter, long time park ranger with the uh, National Park Service. Thank you very much for being with us tonight and presenting on a lesser known figure, but somebody who was who was certainly involved in some of the key campaigns of the Civil War. So uh, I want to thank you for your your time and your your enthusiasm about uh, Burnside. And as as one of uh, one of the audience members asked, uh, uh, your next book should be a, a biography of Burnside. <clears throat> so, <laughs> And I, and, uh, I think you know the person who, uh, who, who made that recommendation, but I also want to thank our audience members who, who uh, attended tonight and participated. Uh, we have one more Civil War Week program tomorrow. Uh, you can go to our website uh, to get more information about that, uh, but that is going to be uh, tomorrow and will be a guided uh, tour by our chief curator, uh, Paul Mirando. And he is going to be um, showing key objects from our Civil War gallery. And I think you all will, will, would really like to see that. So please go to our website and get all the details and register there. Uh, Frank, thanks again. And with that, folks, uh, th uh, I'm going to say good night. And uh, thank you again for coming. Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. It's been great uh, spending the evening with you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>